Hi, everybody. So thank you so much um, for coming. So for the row of people sitting behind me, you do not get to fill this out until you've heard me speak. So put your, put your pencils down there, all right? Um, so how many, how many people in the audience have dogs? Or, yeah, so good. This is a, this is a great dog-friendly audience because we're going to be talking today um, about dogs and a couple of different aspects. We're going to talk about um, health as well as morphology, you know, why dogs are different shapes, um, and, and how all that data sort of comes together to inform us about, about human health um, and human biology um, as well. So um, we'll leave some time. At the end, we'll have lots of time uh, for questions. So, this is the closest ancestor to the dog. Who knows what we're looking at here? What kind of wolf? Gray wolf, right, of course. So, dogs were believed to have domesticated from gray wolves. The latest data suggests maybe around 13,000 years ago. So, evolutionarily, that's really a, that's a drop in the bucket. I mean, that's not very long ago at all. Um, and so one of the things we're always sort of thinking about and pondering about um, when we look at our, our pets wandering around our houses, you know, is whatever they're doing caused by genes that are embedded in this wolf genome? Or, or is this something new that's come up um, during the process of domestication? And that's one of the things that we go back to and we ask ourselves over and over and over um, as we look at all of our friends. So how many of you recognize your dog breed up there? All right, there's gotta be some golden retriever owners, I'm betting, there's probably some schnauzer owners, right? Um, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some hound owners, you know, a Weimaraner owner or two. So these are uh, a small number of the 175 breeds of dog that are recognized by the American Kennel Club. Now, the American Kennel Club is the largest registering body of dogs in the United States today, but they are not by any means the only registering body. There's a United Kennel Club and, and several other kennel clubs as well. And there are kennel clubs actually all over the world that in aggregate recognized 493 different dog breeds today. 493 different dog breeds today. And those dog breeds show an extraordinary amount of variation. Right? So we, we would say that there's probably three things you need to keep in mind um, as, as we're going to talk about dogs for the next 45 minutes or so. It's important to remember that even though all of these guys look very, very different, they have a different body size, different coat colors, different head shapes, different leg lengths, all dog breeds are members of the same species. So they all have the same karyotype or the same chromosomal organization. They all have the same genome organization. Um, and they could be crossed to produce um, fertile offspring. Now, clubs like the American Kennel Club don't really encourage you to cross dogs from, from one breed to the next. And as a matter of fact, to be, for instance, a registered golden retriever, your parents had to be AKC registered golden retrievers, and your grandparents in turn had to be AKC registered golden retrievers. So one of the reasons people like me study dog breeds is because each one represents sort of a closed population. So if you think about human populations that are isolated, you know, people who live in Finland or, or Iceland or people who have lived on islands for many, many generations or the Bedouin pedigrees. Um, geneticists like to study those kinds of populations because there isn't a lot of admixture from the outside. They really have sort of a, a set number of different alleles at each genetic loci and that makes the problem of studying complex traits like diabetes and cancer and epilepsy actually uh, an awful lot easier. The only problem in human genetics is that there's a limited number of such isolated populations, whereas in the dog world we have 493 of them. And so we actually, in, in my lab, have been working hard to get DNA samples from each one of those 493 breeds. We have a great relationship with the American Kennel Club. We don't breed any dogs. We don't keep any dogs in kennels. 
But if you go to a dog show or an obedience trial or a specialty or an agility trial, anywhere here um, in the tri-state area, you're probably going to find someone from my lab there um, taking cheek swabs or handing out kits or collecting blood samples. And we've now got a, a set of 50,000 DNA samples in my laboratory. So that's pretty impressive, huh? So when we look at these dog breeds, we, we really see extremes of, of variation. And um, one of the things that makes a breed a breed is that that variation breeds true. So if you cross one golden retriever to another golden retriever, the puppies are all going to pretty much look the same. And there's some nice examples up here for you. You know, if you cross one Dalmatian to another, they're all pretty much going to look the same. If you cross one boxer to another, they're all pretty much going to look the same. And, and the American Kennel Club is really strict about the things that are important and that define each breed. And, it, and it's different for different breeds. For some breeds, it's, it's their coat color. For some, it's how tall they are. For some, it's how long their legs are. For some, it's the shape of their face, how far apart their eyes are, whether their ears are perked or, or, or whether they're down. And, and when a dog goes into a dog show, those are all the things that the judges are actually grading them on. So because breeders have been breeding for those traits for years and years and years and years and years, those are the things that in my lab, we're trying to find the genes that control them. And in doing so, we're sort of getting a vocabulary of growth regulation that we really can't get from studying worms and flies and mice and rats and all those other traditional model organism systems. Now, I, I really like um, this picture. And don't worry if you, if you can't read the, the writing here. But what we've done is, is we took 1,000 DNA samples from dogs representing 85 different breeds. So we took about 12 different dogs from each breed. Um, and we tested their genome at 100,000 different positions. And we were looking at the variation in the A's and those T's and C's and G's um, that you're always, always hearing about. And then we fed it all into a computer program and we said, tell us how all the dog breeds relate one to another. And, and that's what this wheel, and you can really follow the color coding in the round, um, is telling you so well. So if you look at your upper right, you see there the red. And you see all the spaniels, the American Cocker Spaniel, the English Cocker Spaniel, um, the English Springer Spaniel, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, the Irish Water Spaniel, the Brittany Spaniel, and so on. And if you look over down at about um, 4 o'clock, um, you'll see the sort of bull mastiff type dogs, the miniature bull terrier, the French bulldog, the bulldog, the boxer, and so on. Now, we have this hanging in my lab. And we use this every single day as we're developing a hypothesis. So if I'm going to study something like epilepsy, and I've got a whole bunch of samples from English Springer Spaniels, those are the red up there at, at about 2 o'clock, then I can actually probably go out and, and get DNA from affected American Cocker Spaniels and Irish Water Spaniels and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels that are also affected. And I can probably be correct when I hypothesize that they all got the disease because they carry a mutation in the same gene. And that's because they all share a common set of founders. That's why they're all colored in red. And when I study epilepsy in the, in the mastiff-like breeds, well, they probably have a mutation in a, in a different gene. But when I look at the mastiff and the bull mastiff and the bulldog and the boxer and the French bulldog, again, they're all colored in kind of that teal color. They probably got the disease because, again, they share a mutation in the same gene, and they likely got it from a founder. So how long ago did this founder live? Well, how, how long ago do you think most dog breeds were developed? You know, domestication occurred about 13,000 years ago. How long do you think most dog breeds have been in existence? Any guesses? 200. You're pretty close, about 300 years. 
So most dog breeds were developed in Europe. Most were developed by fanciers um, during the Victorian times. So most of them have only been around really for two or three hundred years. So again, evolutionarily, we're not even talking about a, a drop in the bucket. We're talking about a, you know, a perspiration drop in the bucket. I mean, as tiny as you can really get. So we can make these kinds of hypotheses when it comes to morphology or when it comes to disease susceptibility, and we're usually right. Um, and, and the other thing is that the genes that we end up finding by studying dogs usually turn out to be important for the same things in humans. It's just that, gosh, it's a lot easier to go to my freezer of 50,000 dog DNA samples and pick out a, a few related breeds and, and, and look up their health records and find out what they've got and what they don't have and correspond with their owners and, and, and start studying a pool of affected and a pool of unaffected dogs in, in order to find a, a disease gene of interest. Okay, so this is actually one of my um, favorite, favorite um, dog pictures. Um, so this is a Harlequin Great Dane. It's skeletally among the largest of the dog breeds. And down here is a little Chihuahua, which is skeletally among the, lo uh, the smallest of the dog breeds. Now, we've been studying dog morphology for several years in my lab, and we've published papers describing genes that control body size and leg length and skull shape and, and fur. And we rely on samples from these extremes in the population in order to do studies on things like body size. Again, remember, both of these guys are members of the same species, and they could be crossed, these two guys here, to produce fertile, if singularly unattractive, but nevertheless fertile offspring. And you might want to give a little thought as to who would be the male, who would be the female when you, you know. All right. Um, so, what do we have over here? Okay, so this is again a chihuahua. This is Zeus. I had to put this picture in. Zeus actually holds the 2013 Guinness Book of World Record as the tallest dog. So he is 44 inches at the withers or the shoulders. This is not Photoshop. This is actually how tall Zeus really is. And so um, we've been collecting samples from, from dogs at these extremes as well as everything in the middle in order to find genes that are responsible for this dramatic, dramatic difference in body size that exists within um, this one species. And I can tell you from a, a couple of papers that we've published um, that there are about a, a half a dozen genes that account for most of that size variation. And so uh, I, I didn't put their names up, but if you're, you're interested, I can tell you they're the insulin-like growth factor one gene. Um, there are a couple genes on the X chromosome. There's the insulin growth factor receptor, SMAD2, HMGA2, STC2, growth hormone receptor. And so some of these may sound familiar to you because um, they've been shown in studies of mice um, to, to be important in controlling mouse body size. The only thing is you don't learn a lot from studying mice in this case because you don't find mice that differ in size by 40-fold, right? I mean, wouldn't that be truly frightening? I mean, if you did, right? Um, but of course, we do find that in dogs. So, so we've spent a lot of time identifying the, the genes and, and the mutations that account for variation in body size. And we just published this, and I know it's kind of complicated, but I, I wanted to show it to you because I'm, I'm actually really excited about the implications of, of this study. So if you look on the left, you see a, a bunch of bricks that are either yellow or red. And I know it's probably hard to read on the bottom, but on the bottom is the name uh, of each one of these genes one at a time, growth hormone, IGF-1, so on, until we get to IGF-1. And, and you don't have to worry about, you know, really which gene is which. Um, going along the vertical are the weight in pounds of, of different dog breeds um, that we've assayed. And then um, what the red and the yellow is telling you is that in each one of these genes, there's two possible alleles or there's two possible mutations or, or variants that can occur. One is an ancient variant that we find in wolves. And one is a, a new variant that's only been on the planet for a few hundred years. And, and we only ever see it in domestic dogs. 
Now, the yellow is the ancient variant that we find in wolves, and red is the, the new variant that we've only ever seen in dogs. Now, what's really striking is if we look at really little dogs that weigh like zero to five pounds, all the way across you see red, telling us that those dogs have the, the new variant, the one that we only see in dogs, at every single one of these genes. But as dogs get bigger and bigger and bigger, that drops off till it's basically all mustard yellow. And so all those big dogs are big because they carry the DNA variant that, that came from the ancient wolf. So that's kind of cool. So we took that data and we said, how, how predictive is it? You know, if I, if I actually take what the data is predicting versus what I really see in a panel of 500 dogs, how good is the predictive value of my half a dozen genes? And that's what this line over here on your right is telling you. And the fact that you get a pretty good line from all of those data points is telling you that just those six genes, if we could assay them in every single puppy that was born, would actually have great predictive value for what the final size of the dog is going to be. We'd be right to about 82%. So think about this. This means that you could go to the pound, you could get a puppy, you could get a cheek swab, you could get an assay at these six genes, and you would know what the final size of that puppy is going to be pretty close to, to accurate, to about 82% accurate. So that's really amazing. Six genes, just six genes, control that much variation. Now, one of the things about this study is that it actually only holds true for dogs that weigh up to 90 pounds. And if you think about the giant breeds, the Great Danes, the Newfoundlands, the St. Bernards, these six genes only have about 5% predictive value. So there's probably lots of genes responsible for giantism in dogs that I actually haven't found yet. And that's one of the things that my lab is in the process of doing so that we can extend this line and make it bigger and bigger and bigger until we can actually understand all the genes controlling that full range of body size going all the way up to, you know, 180, 200 pounds. Now, as we've begun to publish more and more of this data, people have gotten really excited and they've kind of picked out different things that they want to study or that breeders would, would like to try and, and breed for. So I have people in my lab studying leg length and studying skull shape. Others are continuing to study body size. Some are even studying performance. Um, and we built a, a big data set based on a thousand different dogs from 85 breeds. And we also included 500 wild canids, so coyotes, um, wolves from all over, all over the world. Um, and and we, we tested their DNA at a thousand different points in the genome. And we've made that DNA publicly available without any restrictions, without any patents um, to anyone who wants it. So, you know, we really encourage other people to, to try and, and think about these problems as well. Now, I like this particular story. This is one that was led by Heidi Parker. And she was a graduate student in my lab. And then she went on to be a postdoc. And then she went on to be a staff scientist. And she's been with me for 15 years. And I actually don't think she's ever going to leave. Um, so Heidi has been really interested in short-legged dogs. And there's about 20 such breeds. They're called chondrodysplastic. They have a ratio of height to body length less than zero, so they sort of have a normal head and a, and a normally proportioned body, but then they have these very short and thick legs. Um, in the dog world, we would say their structure is well-boned or heavy, um, and, and their forelimbs, like you can see on that basset hound, are often sort of bowed or a little bit curved out. So Heidi came to me one day and she said, I, I want to try and find the genes responsible um, for this trait across these 20, G, uh, 20 breeds. And I said, well, you know, this could be a really hard problem. I, it could be that they all share a common mutation, but these breeds were developed for different purposes. Some are developed to, be, to, to go down rabbit holes, some are fox hunters, some are companions, some are ratters. So I said, I'm, I'm not so sure they're all going to have the same 
mutation in the same gene. And she said, well, I, I think this is a really interesting problem. I'm going to try it anyway. And she's not being totally unbiased here because you see that dachshund and that basset hound? Those are actually her dogs. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, when you come to my lab and you work, people are often motivated by things that they have in their own dogs. And, and you know, some of my graduate students are, are top um, show, have top show dogs or top dogs in the agility ring. So um, it's not, I've actually had mushers come and be graduate students in my lab. So again, motivated by uh, trying to understand the underlying genetics. So Heidi went after the gene for chondrodysplasia. Now, um, I know this is, looks like just a bunch of lines to you, but what you're looking at here in the alternating gray and black, each one represents a different dog chromosome. And dogs have 38 um, chromosomes. And we also included the X, but we didn't put in the Y because we figured there was nothing important on the Y anyway. <laughs> and then what we're, we're doing is we're comparing cases who are chondrodysplastic to what we call control, which are all the other breeds that are not chondrodysplastic. And we're looking at, at 100,000 different points in the genome, and we're saying, is there a chromosome um, that has a, a data point that's significantly different between cases and controls? And you can see this is very significantly different here on canine chromosome 11. Um, and, and for those of you who have calculated p-values, the p-value here is 10 to the negative 102. So 0. 0.0000000, put 102 O's, and then a one, and that's how statistically significant it is. So this is hugely statistically significant. So we decided to, to follow up on this, and the way we did it is we looked for something that evolutionary biologists call a selective sweep. So what's a selective sweep? Well, when you have a selective sweep, you assume, as I've told you before, that there's an ancestral mutation that occurred many, many generations ago in this case, before dogs were divided up into lots of different breeds. And then dog breeders breed, and they breed, and they select for different things, and, and, and there's a lot of scrambling of chromosomes, but the mutation stays because they're always still selecting for that one trait, in our case, chondrodysplasia. And so now when we look at modern day dogs, their chromosome may look nothing like the ancient chromosome except for where the mutation is and in the space right around the mutation. And so we look for that region of commonality and when we find a region of commonality across a group of breeds who have a trait, um, then we know the mutation has to be somewhere in there. And that turns out to be exactly the, the case here. So this is an, an old-fashioned gel, and I, I put it up because I think um, probably some of you in, in college had a, have had a chance in science classes <laughs> to run a gel. A gel simply separates DNA based on its size. The control dogs are things like greyhounds and boxers and cocker spaniels. And if you look at the top, you don't really see anything of the gel. But when you look at the case dogs, and these are, of course, are the basset hounds and the dachshunds and the Pekingese, you see a bright yellow, uh, a bright white band. And that's telling you that all of these cases have some extra DNA that's responsible for this trait that's not present in, in the group of controls. So right away, we know that what our mutation is, it's not a single base pair change and it's not a loss of DNA. All these chondrodysplastic breeds have acquired extra DNA. And in fact, they've acquired an extra copy of a gene called fibroblast growth factor 4. Now, they didn't acquire any of the regulatory machinery that tells it when to turn on or when to turn off, but they acquired the full sequence of the gene. And so actually, the genes around it, they sort of parasitize the regulatory machinery from genes around this, this what we call a retrogene. And that's telling it to be expressed in fetal chondrocytes. And you know what that's doing? That's closing the growth plates prematurely. So the legs never elongate as long as they should. This gene is expressed, the growth plate closes, and uh, 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 the leg can't elongate to its full and natural length. And every single one of those 20 breeds I showed you has exactly that gene including this, which is the corgi breed. So this was really exciting, and, and we were able to publish this in Science, not because the editors of Science care about corgis, although I think they should, um, but because 
this was sort of a, a new way to screw up the genome that had never really been described before in mammals. And the other thing is we, of course, know that there are humans who suffer from, from forms of, of what we historically call dwarfism, but it's really chondrodysplasia. Um, and, and we don't always know what's causing that, so now this gene goes into, into that lexicon, into that vocabulary as something that we need to think about when we look at those. So this is a really neat example. Just by studying a, a phenotype that dog breeders have been breeding for for a couple hundred years in a bunch of healthy dogs using DNA from my freezer, we've been able to figure out a, a whole new mechanism for screwing up the genome, and we've been able to add a gene to the medical genetics vocabulary um, that turns out to, to then become very important. So this to us is, is really a huge success. So we've gone on to, to do that in, in several other ways, and, and I'm going to give you one more example in, in morphology, and then I'll give you one example in disease, and then we'll, we'll have some time for questions in the end. What are these? Absolutely. These are all skulls from dogs, and um, these are pictures we took down here at the Smithsonian. Turns out they have a lot of skulls in the back room. Right. And, and these are all different dog breeds, and they differ in both shape and what else? And size, exactly. So when Jeff Schoenbeck joined my lab, he said, I want to find the genes that control this. I want to understand the genetics of skull shape and size in dogs. And I said, well, I don't know. This sounds like a really hard problem. But Jeff had one of these giant Leonberger dogs with a big round kind of fluffy face. And so, you know, this is what he wanted to do, and so that's what we did. Now, the first problem we had was we don't know how to, how do you quantitate a skull, right? I mean, chondrodysplastic is easy. The dogs either have it or they don't have it. And body size is easy. You measure them or you weigh them. How do you actually quantitate a, a skull? It turns out to be a hard problem. Um, but we solved it, and, and what we do is we have something called a microscribe digitizer, and we touch each skull at 51 different landmarks, and that sends data to a computer, and then in the end, the computer takes a 51 data pieces and it draws a three-dimensional picture of what that particular skull looks like. So here I'm showing you top and bottom and side views of a particular dog's skull. And everywhere there's a red or a blue number, that's one of those data points that we've, we've gotten. So the, the palate can be long or short. That's the roof of your mouth for a dog that has a long or a short snout. That angle in picture C between the rostrum and the, and the nose, that can be, you know, pretty much a, a ski slope, or it can be at a right angle like it is in a Newfoundland. We would say they have a, a Roman nose or a very high forehead. And there's variation, actually, in every one of these traits. Now, we've actually been fortunate to travel around the world. We've measured about 1,000 skulls. Um, from 161 different breeds. And people always ask me, where do you go to do this? And we go to lots of museums, and certainly the Smithsonian is the first place we went. Um, but we've been to museums and universities all over the country, and actually all over the world. Um, the university in, in Switzerland actually has something like 2,000 canine skulls um, that we're about halfway through measuring now. But I have to, I have to admit, there are a group of people in the United States that have a lot of skulls in their basement. And I don't know why, but they do. And they all call me and they say, you know, I got a bunch of dog skulls. Why don't you come down and measure? And this is Alex, one of the people in my lab, and she's measuring the dog skulls. This is a gentleman in California who called us to fly out and go down to his basement and measure all the skulls. And you can see he has all kinds of animal skulls. We really don't know why. We don't ask those questions. We just measure the dog skulls and, and get out of there. But you know, there's a lot of these people in America. They all want to friend me in Facebook. It's a whole, it's a whole culture thing. So anyway, but, but um, these people have been very generous with their collections. And we've actually gotten a lot of data from skulls where we could verify the breed and we could verify um, the, the age. Okay, so this is, this is in some ways sort of a tragic slide. So 
Um, this is really what motivated Jeff to begin this, this project. So in the left-hand column are a set of human conditions that, that are really different kinds of craniofacial abnormalities. And I know not, you're not familiar with most of those words, but they describe different um, abnormalities that, that we see, unfortunately, in, in humans, often associated um, with particular syndromes. And, and next to them are breeds where the, where the breeders are actually trying to breed that in as part of the breed standard. And, and really one of the, the examples that I, I, I use, and this is not something that the American Kennel Club is doing, this is not an AKC breed, but this dog shown here is a Pashan Navarro. Um, and, and the breed standard includes having this deep cleft that goes all the way from the outside of the snout um, all the way down in um, to the roof of the mouth. So, you know, this is not something that uh, American breeders are, are, are advocating, but, you know, it is something that, you know, we see, and so we want to try and find those genes um, because we think that'll help us understand something about cleft lip and cleft palate, and we're actually interested in, in all of these um, craniofacial features. So the one that we've been doing the most work with is called brachycephaly. And that means having a very pushed in face. So if you think about your Saturday morning cartoons, those of you that are old enough, and some, you know, something happens and you know, the face just kind of accordions in, like Nyeh, kind of like that, right? And, and so that's the kind of appearance you see in the pug or the cane corso. Um, and that's very different than what you see in the Afghan and the Bull Terrier, which have very elongated noses, and that's referred to as a dolcocephalic phenotype. So a long nose versus that very pushed in um, face. So we've been going um, after um, these kinds of genes, and we do the exact same experiment over and over. We comb the genome, and we look for evidence of a selective sweep, and that's what the data actually looks like. So. Um, these are our base pair positions along canine chromosome 30, and you see a certain level of chatter, and then when you get right here, you can see this big dip. And that's telling us that there's a selective sweep there, that that's a, a place where there's a lot of homogeneity, that something breeders have been selecting on for years and years and years and years. So they don't know that there's a gene under there. They don't know what the gene is they've been selecting on, um, but we're going to find it and we're going to tell them what it is. Okay, so um, here are a set of, of 12 dog breeds that my lab has now sequenced. Um, we've sequenced these breeds uh, pretty deeply, so we've got a pretty good genomic sequence. And we picked these breeds for lots and lots of reasons. Um, we have lots of different studies going on, and, and there's another, actually, 40 dog breeds that, that we and others have sequenced as well. Um, but these were the first 12, and, and partly we picked them because if you think about going very brachycephalic to very dolicocephalic, you have a really nice continuum. So we will be able to use this data to try and figure out what's underneath that little V, that statistical blip that the breeders have been selecting on over and over by comparing the brachy and the dolicocephalic dogs. Now, you've heard a lot about the Genome Project, and usually people talk about the Human Genome Project. When I hear about the Genome Project, I think about the Canine Genome Project, because that's what's really important to me. So, uh, I know this again looks like a, a checkerboard, but um, each one of the rows is giving us information about the sequence variation we saw in those 12 dog breeds. So we started out with 190,000 base pairs and 2,000 possible variants. And then we started filtering and filtering. We got it down to 85,000 variants and 48 variants. And in the end, when we applied the sequence of all those other breeds, we were able to find the single base pair in the single gene that turns out to be important, and it's how canine chromosome 30 contributes to that facial phenotype. So the gene is called bone morphogenesis protein 3. Kind of makes sense. It's a bone morphogenesis protein. And it is a single base pair change that changes one amino acid phenylalanine to leucine, one amino acid. 
Now, when Jeff came to me with that data, I said, gosh, you know, I believe you, but in order to publish this, we're, you know, we're going to have to have more proof. And so Jeff did lots of statistical studies, and they all looked really, really good. And we wrote it up, and I said, you know, it's pretty good, but I, I think we're just going to need just a little, a little bit more proof to get it into one of the fancy journals. And Jeff said, well, okay, I can knock that gene out in zebrafish, and I can make a pug-nosed fish. And I said, you're going to make a pug-nosed zebrafish? And he said, I'm going to make you a pug-nosed zebrafish. And so there's a, a technique he used, and he knocked that gene out, and that is exactly what Jeff made. Um, so let's, let's forget the top row for a second. I'll come back to that. But if you look where it says E, F, and G, that's a, a zebrafish, um, you know, several, about 48 hours after the embryo was fertilized. Um, and it, it didn't get injected with the stuff that knocked out the gene. And then the blue is the, the cartilage from the top of the jaw, the top jaw, uh, and the, the G is the bottom jaw. And now the other two are examples of fish that did get injected with what we call morpholinos, and they knock that gene out. Um, and, and you can see that the jaw is gone especially that bottom jaw. Look, there's almost no blue staining in J and M. Um, and, and even the top jaw is pretty screwed up as well. So in essence, Jeff made me up pugnose zebrafish. And indeed, in doing so, demonstrated that by knocking out just that one gene, we're able to dramatically affect um, the jaw structure. And so this gene, in fact, does turn out to, to be important in one particular type of, of human cranial facial abnormality. So this is another example of, of how, you know, we started with, with healthy dogs, long-lived dogs, but they had a particular phenotype that sort of pushed in face. And, and we've been finding the genes responsible for that, and there's not just one. It turns out there's actually several. And in aggregate, they are responsible for the dramatic difference between being, being brachycephalic with a pushed-in nose or dolicocephalic with that elongated nose. And we can prove we're right by going to some of these model organisms like zebrafish, which are these sort of little tiny fish um, that, that people use in the lab sometimes. Okay, so those are examples of, of how my lab has been studying morphology. And, and right about this point in time, someone usually says to me, well, you know, that's great, but gosh, dogs have an awful lot of diseases. Do you, do you actually directly study any of those diseases as well? And if you do, are they telling us something about human disease? And the answer to both those questions is a resounding yes. So here are the top 10 genetic diseases in dogs. And what do you notice is number one? Right. About one in how many humans will get cancer in their lifetime? Anybody? About one in four people will get cancer, some kind of cancer at some point in their life. They may not die of it, but they'll get it. And about one in three dogs will get cancer in their lifetime as well. How many of you have had a dog or a cat who got cancer. Yeah, right. So um, in my lab, we do, in fact, study several different types of, of cancer. Now, this is one of my favorite dog pictures ever. It was actually sent to me by a, a, a very uh, well-known and, and very generous dog breeder, and she breeds, what are these? Standard poodles, right, these are standard poodles. So about four years ago, we started getting phone calls from people who own standard poodles, telling us that the dogs were getting a particular kind of cancer, and it's called squamous cell carcinoma. And oddly, it was occurring in the toes. And sadly, the way the veterinarians have to treat it is they actually have to remove the toes. And so that's horrible for the dogs, it's horrible for the owners. Um, if the dog is a show dog, it won't be after that, and, and people obviously don't want to breed to those dogs after, after that. And so this is really a, a, a big deal for this community. But what was so interesting about this is they said, you know, 
We only ever see the disease in black standard poodles and we never see it in white standard poodles. And so we've now looked at hundreds of standard poodles and we see it in black and brown, very, 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 very dark gray, but we don't see it in the white or the cream or, or the apricot dogs. So we thought, well, you know, there's a lot of selection for coat color in standard poodles. Maybe they've been inadvertently selecting for a, a cancer gene as well. And that, in fact, turns out to be the case. Now, let me just tell you that we study lots of kinds of cancer in my lab. And in fact, across the world, dog geneticists study lots of kind of cancer. So um, those of you who have long limb breeds like Scottish Deerhounds or Irish Wolfhounds probably worry about osteosarcoma. Um, we see tons of bladder cancer in Scotties and Westies and Shelties, and we actually have a, a paper we're writing about that now that comes again from sequencing tumors, uh, the DNA from tumors that we find in those dogs. If you've got a Bernese Mountain dog, a super wonderful um, dog breed that's really increasing in popularity, or a flat-coated retriever, one in four, one in six of those dogs will get um, malignant histiocytosis or, or histiocytic sarcoma. Stomach cancer, we see in the Belgian Sheepdog, the Belgian Traverne, as well as in the Chow Chow, universally lethal. Dogs don't survive it. And the idea here is we study these in dogs because the breed structure, as I told you at the beginning, simplifies the overall problem. We'll see shared genetics among affected dogs, and it'll be distinct from what we see of healthy dogs of the same or, remembering the wheel, very related um, dog breeds. So this is a picture of squamous cell carcinoma. You can see that the toe is sort of blown out. It's the most common nail bed cancer in dogs. If you are a giant schnauzer, your chances of getting this are 22-fold higher than the average mixed breed dog walking down the street. If you are a Briard, your chances are 10-fold higher than the average mixed breed dog walking down the street. And if you're a standard poodle, they're about six-fold higher, although standard poodles are where we see most of this because they're the most popular of those three breeds. And again, in the cases of standard poodles, we only see it in the black dogs, not in the white. For really complicated reasons, in, in the Briard, we actually see it in black as well as white dogs, and we figured out why that is. It's actually a, a, a very, very complicated genetic story. But let me tell you a little bit about standard poodles. So, we again combed the genome with our 100,000 points of variation. Um, and we found a, a signal on canine chromosome 15. It wasn't as strong as what we saw when we were looking at those morphologic traits because breeders haven't been trying to breed cancer into dogs the way they're trying to breed, you know, you know short legs or large body size. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's there and it's, and it's in a lot of dogs. I think this is the, the last of the, the data slides that I'll show you. Um, and so what, what we did is we, we found a region on canine chromosome 15. It was about a million base pairs long. We sequenced it in lots of affected and unaffected dogs. And everywhere that there was a possible mutation, there is a triangle. And then we defined a region um, that, you know, maybe if we were liberal in our thinking was about 500,000 bases in size, and if we're conservative in our thinking, it's about 800,000 bases in size. And what's cool is there's only one gene in that region, and that gene is called Kit Ligand. And we knew instantly that we had found the right gene because it's a gene that's important in coat color, but it's also a gene that's been shown to be important in cancer. So we did a lot of work that took about three years, and we, in fact, um, found the mutation. And in this case, we, again, found sort of a, a new and interesting way that the genome gets screwed up. So it turns out that the mutation is, again, extra DNA. It's not a deletion. It's, a, it's an insertion of about 5,000 bases, and it can be present one, two, three, four, five, or six times. And the more times it's present, the more these green proteins bind. And the more these green proteins bind, the more they ramp up production of this gene kit ligand. And the higher you ramp up production of this, the greater the chances are that you're going to get the cancer. So if you're a dog who has this insert present on both of your chromosomes four or more times, 
boy, your chances of getting cancer are really, really high. If you have it maybe four times on one chromosome, three on the other, it's sort of moderate. But four is really the threshold. If both of your chromosomes have it repeated three times or two times or one time or any combination thereof, no chance you're going to get cancer. No chance. And we've looked at hundreds and hundreds of dogs and we've never even found one. So this is one of these sort of threshold deals where you have to get kit ligand ramped up to a certain point um, in order for it to go ahead um, and cause the cancer. So it makes it hard to develop a, a, a genetic predictive test, um, but people are, are in the process of doing that. We found out why white standard poodles didn't get this. It isn't because they didn't carry the mutation, um, the 4-4, genotype. They, didn't, they do indeed have chromosomes where, where this insert is present multiple times, but they have a compensatory mutation on a, another gene called MC1R, and it completely knocks this out. So it's a case where they have a bad mutation, but they have a good mutation and good triumphs over evil in this case. And so they never, ever get this, even though they carry the bad genotype. So it's an important lesson because just looking for the presence of absence of the bad genotype isn't really totally predictive. You also have to look for the presence or absence of the compensatory mutation. And all the white standard poodles have it. None of the black standard poodles have it. And so that explains the, the difference in, in what we observed in, in coat color. So I'm going to stop there. We have uh, uh, about 15 minutes to ask questions or 12 minutes or so. I hope I've showed you that dogs are a really fun system for looking at both simple and complex traits, including susceptibility to cancer, which is, of course, a very complex trait. When we study morphology in dogs, we learn things that are important about development of all mammals, um, and that includes humans um, as well. Um, for both canine and, and human health, these studies of cancer have become very, very important. And there are labs really um, at vet schools as, as well as at non-vet schools that are studying every conceivable kind of cancer, as well as all the other common human diseases, epilepsy, diabetes, heart disease, you know, whatever you got, including morphologic traits you don't like, like baldness or obesity or things like that. Um, those, there are labs all over the world that are, are studying those things as well. Many of these studies are long-term, some are short-term. There are a number of disease genes that we've been able to find the mutation for. We've been able to develop a genetic test, and breeders are now using those genetic tests to make really good decisions to, to, to produce healthier, more long-lived dogs. So, you don't see kidney cancer in, in the German Shepherd anymore, and, and we've been able to wipe out collie eye anomaly, which is a degenerative disease of collies and border collies and, and a number of herding breeds, as, as well as several, several other diseases. And this has all been done um, in collaboration with breeders and owners and veterinarians actually all, all over the world. Samples are always needed. So if any of you have a really interesting dog breed, I gave this talk yesterday and a man came up to me afterwards and said, I have a Shiba Inu if you want DNA from that. Yes, we do want DNA if you've got an interesting dog breed. Um, we love your labs, we love your golden retrievers, we love your German Shepherds, but we probably have enough DNA on those. Um, but the more esoteric breeds, we're still always collecting um, more DNA from. And, you know, great progress um, can be made, um, but, you know, it is necessary to, to get the DNA samples and allow us the, the time to do our work. So for the breeders in the audience, I know many of you have contributed samples and you wonder how long it's going to take. Well, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's going to be five or six years because some of these problems um, end up being simple, some of them end up being very complex. But our goal is always to, to make available to you some sort of a diagnostic test. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop there um, and allow you to turn up, maybe turn up the lights. Turn up the lights. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and take questions. OK? Fire away. The 
This, this slide? How do we find out what? How do we find out the disease risk? So what we did is we got DNA from a lot of poodles who had the disease and a lot of poodles who didn't have the disease. And, and then we sequenced it to see how many times this was reiterated. Um, and how many times this particular 5.7 base pair unit was re repeated. And we actually knew from looking at the human genome, we knew exactly what these 5,000 base pairs do. We knew that this protein binds to them, and when it does, it ramps up production of, of kit ligand. So we can do statistics looking at dogs who have two copies, three copies, four copies, five copies, and we can look at them at 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, 13 years, 14 years, and see who does and doesn't have cancer. And from that, we can figure out what the risk is for a dog who has three copies or four copies or five copies. And four is really the cutoff. If, if both of your chromosomes have three copies or two copies or one copy, we've looked at hundreds of dogs, and not a one of those dogs has this kind of cancer. But as soon as one chromosome gets four cans, has the, the repeat repeated four times, then we, we start to see the incidence of cancer creeping up. And the more you have, um, the higher it gets, okay? And, and there are, you know, formal statistical tests that we can apply to that. And if, if you're interested, if you've sort of got a statistical mind, come see me afterwards and I'll, I'll give you the paper and the tests that we use. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Sure. So the question was, um, is epilepsy indeed prominent in dogs? And yes, we see it in lots and lots of dog breeds. And have we um, found genes? We, we've been part of one study that identified one gene, published it um, with a group in Belgium uh, several years ago in science. But lots of other people are looking at this problem because, you know, not only is it an important problem in humans, it's a big deal in dogs. I mean, if your dog has epilepsy, I mean, that is a, a lifelong problem that you as a pet owner have to, to deal with. And, and certainly those dogs don't show and, and people don't, you know, put them in the breeding pool if they know. Um, and so some of those genes have been found, not all of them have been found. And there are some breeds where it's a much worse problem than it is in other breeds. Um, so that's one of the areas um, where we see some of the most um, active and intense work. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, this is sort of a general one, not just a question. Okay, I probably won't know the answer, but go ahead. Um, well, I was just wondering if you knew what sort of breeds made up the dog reference genome. Oh, yeah, sure, I do, because I picked the breed uh, for the reference <laughs> genome. So he asked me um, what breed or breeds make up the dog reference genome. So it's one breed and it's one single dog. So in, in 2001, I had the chance to, to pick the dog that was going to be sequenced. Um, and, you know, truthfully what I did is I probably looked at 100 different dogs of all breeds and I picked the most inbred dog I could find. And the reason for that is the way genomes are sequenced is not from the top of chromosome 1 to the bottom of chromosome 38. What they do is they cut the DNA up into a zillion little pieces and then they sequence it all randomly and then they have a computer put it back together. So if what you got from mom is really different than what you got from dad, it's a harder computational problem. If what you got from mom and dad is pretty similar, it's a much simpler computational problem. So I tested a, 100 dogs at 100 places in their genome and there was one dog that was easily the most inbred. It was a boxer and it was from New York State, and, and as luck would have it, it was actually owned by a veterinarian. So when I went to him and I explained that his dog was the lucky winner, I mean, he actually understood that this was really important. Um, he provided us with an awful lot of DNA, and he understood that, you know, when the dog, it was a pet, you know, like all of our dogs are, um, that when the, the dog died, that we, you know, we would like to get some samples from that dog because it was, in fact, going to be the reference genome. And his only request was that I not divulge his name, which I've never done, or his location, which I've never done. So he was great. He was fantastic. But it was a boxer, and her, and it was a she. Almost all the reference genomes, except maybe human, are she, um, because then we get good data on the X chromosome. So, 
So is, have we found a gene linked to fur loss in, in breeds like the, the Yorkie? So I haven't looked at that. There are breeds like the Chinese Crested or, or the Mexican Hairless. There are breeds that have very little fur except for some tufts at the top of their head and down by their toes. And those genes have in fact been found. But those dogs, that's part of the breed standard. That's how they're, they're, they're supposed to look. Um, when a dog blows all of its fur, I mean, and that's an anomalous sort of thing. Um, I'm sure there are people looking at it. I'm not one of them, and I'm not aware of a paper, but I could certainly tell you where in the literature to look for it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so the question is, what are the, the healthiest breeds? And it's a little bit of a trick question. And, and the reason is because within every breed, there are lines that are really healthy. The breeders are very savvy. They've gotten dogs from multiple places in the, the world that are members of that breed or multiple places in the United States that are members of that breed. And they've worked really hard to, to maintain the hybrid vigor of that breed. And, and there are other breeders, you know, who have bred a lot of closely related individuals one to another, and their lines may look good, but they have a lot of health problems. So there's, there's no one right answer. I mean, you can look on the internet and, and, you know, they'll certainly give you those, that kind of information. And they'll say things like, well, you see a lot of cancer in, in boxers or in golden retrievers, or you see a lot of, copper toxicosis in the Bedlington Terrier. You see, you know, there's different diseases that tend to predominate in different breeds. Um, there are, are some situations where, where disease is so predominant, like copper toxicosis was in the Bedlington Terrier before the gene was found. That I think that was a fair comment. You know, there are other cases where I think you just have to really search. I mean, I wouldn't be hesitant to own a golden retriever or you know, a German Shepherd or, or any of these other really popular breeds. I would just work really hard to, to talk to people the breeder had sold to and find dogs that lived a, a really long, a really long life. In general, small dogs live longer, for sure. The Terriers, the toy dogs, um, in general, they do live longer. Um, and dogs that have a working job, like Border Collies, Boy, some of those live 17, 18 years. My border collie lived to be 13 years. So breeds where there's a, a working lineage, I mean, they have to be healthy to work. Um, those tend to, to be pretty long lived. The really big breeds tend to have more heart difficulties and problems. St. Bernard's and um, you know some of these giant breeds where they've just almost been bred to be too big for their heart. Um, you know, they, they rarely live beyond the age of 10 or 11 um, because they almost always go from, for heart problems. So, you know, I always tell people to, you know, pick the breed you want, pick the breed that matches your family. There's all kinds of tests on the internet to help you do that. Um, and, but then work with, you know, really look around and take your time um, to find a, a healthy and, and reliable breeder. Yeah. No, so she the question she asks is, are breeds that are more related to wolf healthier? And I guess I would say no, and, you know, in part because things that maybe look more wolfish, um, you know, like the Malamute or the Husky, I mean, you know, there, there were clearly multiple domestication events that occurred in multiple places in, in the world, and, and, you know, by and large, Truly, it's the small dogs that are the healthiest and, and really do live the, the longest. And so I wouldn't necessarily say those are, you know, among the healthiest. Although, you know, I had a Malamute that lived to be like 15 or 16. So, um, you know, again, dogs that have a working function. But this was bought from a line of dogs that, you know, were involved in mushing. And so that's, you know, those are going to be healthy dogs. So I wouldn't necessarily say that. Other questions? Yeah. Do mixed breeds do better than purebreds? Do mixed breeds do better than purebreds? You know, everybody thinks that they're going to. And I have so many people come up to me and say, I brought a Labradoodle or a, you know, they have all these weird, cool names. Um, and they said, you know, and, and so, 
hybrid vigor, you know, I'm, I'm, my dog's going to live to be 22. And um, then they're shocked when they don't. And, and the reason is because, you know, if the, if the parent breeds or the parent lines were themselves not healthy, particularly if they were not healthy because they had the same disease or the same mutation, you haven't, it doesn't do any good, right? And so, um, you know, golden retrievers, you know, they get a bad reputation for having a lot of inherited disease. I think there are some lines of golden retrievers that are wonderful out there, but there are also some lines that really do have a, a lot of disease. And because they're so good with families, they're involved in an awful lot of these crosses. Um, and, and um, you know, you could say that of lots and lots of other breeds. So, you know, in general, what, what I like about purebred dogs is you sort of know what you're getting. You know, most poodles I know live long, 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 long periods of time. They're an awesome breed in all three sizes. Um, they have a reputation in the breed club for being very vigilant, being very careful. And so I don't necessarily think that's, that's really the best choice. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, you know, removing mutations, does that happen widely? So it isn't really removing mutations in, in, in the sense um, of how that language is used, but it's really um, about breeding it out. So breeding a carrier, not to another carrier, but to a healthy dog. And when I talk to breed clubs, I tell them, first thing, don't throw all the carriers out of the breeding pool because they're contributing so many good things that you're going to just end up with something else you didn't have a problem in before. But, but take your carrier and breed them to a non-carrier. The car Get the progeny tested, breed carriers to non-carriers, and gradually breed it out. And we've seen examples where, where a small breed has thrown out all the carriers and they have a, a disease that's really prevalent and then suddenly they have three other diseases um, that crop up as recessive. The American Kennel Club has just been wonderful. I mean they they ask us to come to all their meetings and their and their specialty events and and their trials and we are inundated with invitations to come and give talks about exactly these kinds of issues um, and Labs like mine often make the data available without patenting it. Sometimes it is patented, but often without patenting it, just so the test can get out there and people can start using it. And breeders are some of the smartest geneticists in the world. They absolutely use it because it's their livelihood. They want to breed healthier, more long-lived dogs. And if they're the first off the block with a reputation for using genomics to breed healthier, more long-lived dogs, people love that. People love that. Um, and so I have found that this, I mean, I have 50,000 DNA samples in my freezer, and I can think of one incidence where I asked for a DNA sample and I was turned down. Go ahead. My question goes back to the, the mixing question. So in, in agriculture, the way you find new traits or understand the mechanisms of how traits happen is by crossing the breeds, so that you can look at the non-additive effects and things like that. Is there a, a push in the dog world No, no, there isn't. <laughs> right. So, so the question um, that was asked was: Is there a is there a push in the dog world to you know mix dogs of different breeds um, to to try and figure out what's going on with the genetics of, of some of these traits? I just put this up because it's my favorite picture in the slideshow. Um, and the answer to that is is no. First of all, we don't breed or keep any dogs, so we're not going to do that. Um, and in the purebred dog world, um, you know, people, you know, the, the convention is you breed dogs of one breed only to members of the same breed. Um, and that's just not the convention in that community, you know, to, to take a, a dog that may be a popular sire and breed him to a bunch of other breeds to figure out what's going on. That's just not what, what, what is done. So it really isn't. And, you know, I'm not in the management of the American Kennel Club, so it's not really for me to say. But. Okay, one more. Can I take yeah, one more one question? question? All right. One more question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned you have about like 50,000 uh, data points. Uh, are they all pure breed or do you also have mixed breeds and lots of 
So I, have, I take 100,000 data points and I have 50,000 DNA samples from dogs in my freezer. Um, I have, my lab has very few mixed breed dogs. Almost all of those are from purebred dogs. They're not all American Kennel Club recognized breeds. You know, some of them are odd, you know, European or Asian breeds. They're not all AKC breeds, but they are pure breeds. They're not mixed breeds. But there are other labs that have focused their studies on mixed breeds. So there's one at Cornell who specializes in village dogs. And he's traveled all over Mexico, South America, Africa, to the outskirts of town on the garbage dumps. And, and he and his team sample hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mixed breed dogs. And that's, you know, his thing. So, you know, you kind of can't do everything. And so that's been, you know, where my focus has been. But there, there are certainly people doing that. All right, I'm going to let you go. There's lots to see out in the museum, um, and I'll be around for questions. And thank you all for your attention.